After a gunshot, King Louis XIV of France, who has returned victorious from years of war, is assassinated, wounded, and falls in front of the countless people who greet him. He climbs onto his horse with difficulty and touches the spot where he was shot. The warm blood makes his heart flutter, just a few millimeters short of hitting his heart. For the first time, Louis perceives that death is so close to him, and even he, who calls himself the Sun King and is invincible on the battlefield, cannot live forever. The royal physician, who is bandaging his wounds, understands the king's concern from his gloomy look, so the royal physician talks to the king about the research he's been doing lately, exploring the mysteries of attaining eternal life. It is said that deep under the sea, there lives a group of mysterious mermaids with some kind of organ that can give human beings the power of eternal life. Louis is intrigued. He finds the most powerful captain in France and rewards him with a pardon for his previous crimes by ordering him to travel immediately to the lost empire of Atlantis to find and capture the legendary mermaids. Captain Ives, who has a great deal of seafaring experience, climbs on a high mast and soon spots the mermaid in the dark sea. Then the men are ordered to aim at the location and accurately drop gunpowder in fishing nets, successfully catching two mermaids, a male and a female, and eventually the male mermaid is released back into the sea, while the female mermaid is kept in a cage and floats across the ocean. After a long journey of several days, it is placed in the watery dungeon built at Versailles specifically for the imprisonment of mermaids. Since receiving word from the captain, the royal physician has stood in front of his bookshelf every day, searching for and studying records about mermaids, concluding that a solar eclipse soon would be the perfect time for the king to gain eternal life. But the mermaid, who loses its freedom, seems to lose its will to save its life, and with its injuries from the long trip, it becomes very weak at this point, and hides under the water every day, not wanting to come out, or eat anything. The king, who gets the news, hurries to the watery dungeon and demands that the captain must find a way to restore the mermaids to a vibrant state before the eclipse. The king's most trusted minister, De La Chais father, sees the mermaid's appearance but is disturbed. He believes that the mermaid, like man, is a self-thinking, soulful and God-blessed creature. The doctor's plan to kill the mermaids for immortality is blasphemous, so he urges the king to let the mermaids return to the sea. But Louis, whose reason has been invaded by imaginations of immortality that can bring France a bright future, does not listen to any of Father's advice, and instead questions him why he always has to be his enemy. There is no way out, Father has to give up persuading the king for the time being. In addition to the shadow of death, Louis also faces a serious problem, because after years of foreign wars, the treasury has been depleted to the point that there is not much money left. A king without money, even if has eternal life will not be able to lead his country on a bright path. It coincides with the entry of Michel Lantiac, son of the richest man in France, into the palace of Versailles for an audience with the king and a beautifully ornate birthday present for him. In addition to showing goodwill, the son of the richest man has another purpose, wanting to obtain the title of nobility and realize the leap in social status, so he donated another two million huge gold coins to King Louis XIV in the name of the duchy. This gives father a new hope. At lunch with the king, father suggests that Louis can marry his illegitimate daughter, Marie, to Mitchell Anchiac to fill the treasury, which has been deflated by the war, by means of a marriage. Mary, the king's illegitimate daughter, who has been secretly raised in a seaside convent since birth, is mentioned for the first time. In order to increase the weight of Mary in Louis's mind, he also mentions the girl's extraordinary musical talent. It just so happens that Louis is tired of the same wake-up music every morning and agrees to father's offer to take Mary back to live in Versailles, but on one condition, Mary's true identity must be kept secret, and he needs the right timing to maximize the benefits. With his permission, father rushes to the seaside convent to welcome Mary back to Versailles. Even the abbot's reminder to father that Mary is very rebellious and disobedient at this time, disregarding any discipline and always sneaking off to swim in the sea, does not dampen father's enthusiasm. As far as he is concerned, he only needs to make sure that Mary's musical talents are welcome in the royal court. Thus, Mary returns to this extravagant and glittering hell. As soon as Mary appears in Versailles, she attracts countless contemptuous stares. The aristocrats, who are dressed up all day long, but whose lives are actually empty, have made gestures of dislike and avoidance towards her. But Mary does not care about their attitude. Instead, she is attracted by the beautifully shaped fountain and walks uncontrollably in the direction of the pool, wanting to get a closer look at it. The king is riding by, and the sudden gush of water from the spring makes Mary slip and fall into the pool, making a terrible mess. Knowing that she has made a mistake, the girl hangs her head low and waits to suffer the wrath of the king. To her surprise, instead of reprimanding her for her recklessness, the king takes off his cloak and graciously drapes it over Mary's body before speaking gently. That statue is indeed a woman who has made many people lose themselves, although most of them are men, but Mary's behavior can be forgiven. Mary's nervousness is soothed a little as she listens to the king's gentle voice and feels the warmth from her cloak. She thinks to herself that she will surely love and support their king more than the others. More surprisingly, the king leaves with a message for Mary to move to the new composer's residence. This means that Mary has made the leap from no-name musician to the king's designated chief composer, taking on the task of waking him up every day. 
she surveys the spacious room filled with various musical instruments, and her mouth unconsciously cracks open in a way that gives away the excitement and exhilaration she feels at this time. Mary seems to have foreseen the future freedom that belongs to her, doing all the things she wants to do with impunity. So Mary secretly vows that she will create a new tune that will satisfy the king. But there is a study by psychologists that the more purposeful you are, the harder it is to succeed. The same thing happens to Mary, who, no matter how hard she tries, can't write a satisfactory tune. When she is distracted, she suddenly hears a song coming from the window, a beautiful tune that hits her in the deepest part of her soul. Mary immediately puts down the cello in her hand and goes to the window to listen to the music. Even the cello that is thrown aside is also shaken by the music. Mary thinks to herself, if only she can put this song into a tune, so that the king in the whole world can feel this beauty with her. So she takes her cello, quietly avoids the guards at Versailles, and follows the sound to a hidden cellar. Mary realizes that the closer she gets to the water source, the clearer the song becomes. Driven by curiosity, she squats down by the water's edge with her skirt in hand and observes carefully. Within moments, a mysterious creature in the water suddenly swims up to her and gazes sadly at her, as if to confide its troubles to Mary. The moment they manage to lock eyes, the captain watching the mermaid realizes Mary's presence and swoops over to take her away from the water's edge. Called me here. Who called you? With her music. Why can't you hear it? However what the captain hears is not music at all, but a noise similar to that made by dolphins or whales. But Mary can't care about the captain's feelings, and takes advantage of the burst of inspiration to practice the song sung by the mermaids at the water's edge. The tune, which incorporates the mermaid's light melancholy, is a great success and highly praised by the king. To show his love for the new tune, he invites Mary to a masquerade ball tonight. As soon as the dressed-up Mary arrives at the ball, she gains countless stares. They stare at her either jealously or adoringly, and nothing can divert their attention anymore. This also includes Mary's marriage partner, Michel Lantiac, the son of France's richest man. He falls in love with Mary at first sight and hurries to her side, leaving his existing partner behind, and extends an invitation to dance with her in the hope of winning her favor. It turns out that the girl, who grows up in a convent, doesn't know how to dance. To ease Mary's plight and show everyone what she looks like when she sparkles, Louis decides to teach her the art of dancing himself. Following the king's rhythm, Mary presents her first dance with ease and perfection. For those who don't know, there is no way to realize the truth that Mary can't dance. The girl's smiling, twirling form in the light makes the king drift off, uncontrollably remembering Mary's mother, the woman he failed. He suddenly realizes that the girl in front of him is not only a commodity that he can exchange for profit, but also the only bloodline between him and the woman he loves. The fireworks that are lit outside the window interrupt Lewis's thoughts, and he simply ignores the pang of guilt that floods through his heart, deliberately, in the name of enjoying the fireworks. After the ball, Mary can't wait to get to the water dungeon to share with the mermaid the king's demeanor at the ball, as well as the brilliant and spectacular fireworks in the night sky. After getting a response from the mermaid, Mary simply jumps into the water to get closer to her friend. She looks at the mermaid's enchanting figure in the water, as if there is a mysterious sense that prompts her to reach out her hand and gently touch the mermaid's cold and smooth skin. After that she gets another gesture from the mermaid, resting on her shoulder, and begins to tour the underwater world. Meanwhile, the Imperial Doctor has made new progress in his research. He confirms that the heart of the mermaid is the source of mankind's everlasting power. An incident that happens next also corroborates that his suspicions are right. On this day Mary is playing a horse riding game with the captain in the park in Versailles, and because she is not paying attention to her surroundings, she accidentally trips over an outstretched branch and falls off the horse, causing a serious fracture of her arm. The royal doctor says indifferently after the examination, it seems that only amputation can save Mary's life. The royal doctor's words make Mary instantly pale. As a cellist, her hand is her most precious thing. If it is amputated, it is equivalent to her losing the qualification to continue playing music. Father, who knows Mary's life, can't bear to see her go through this ordeal, so he asks the doctor to make a final judgment tomorrow morning. It is a difficult night as Mary lies in bed silently weeping. Meanwhile, the mermaid in the watery dungeon seems to sense her pain and begins to surface, emitting a golden glow to attract the captain's attention. Miraculously, the captain reads it as well and rushes to climb the window to sneak into Mary's hospital room and steal her out. Following the mermaid's instructions, Mary is released into the water and slowly sinks. At that moment, the mermaid comes to her side, and after carefully examining the injury on her hand, she then begins to swim around her while releasing golden life force. With the help of the mermaid, Mary not only regains her health, but also has the ability to breathe underwater. The next morning Mary is able to play with the court festival, her arm is flexible as if it had never been injured. Her ordeal catches the interest of the king and the royal physician. Unaware of the king's plans, the girl happily shares with them the whole story of how the mermaid helped her heal her injury. Incontrovertible proof, majesty. Proof? The royal doctor's words confuse Mary. She doesn't understand what the king's purpose is in capturing the mermaids. Is the king also sick and in need of treatment? 
Louis, however, tells her that no one is sick, it's just that her new friend is going to bring a brand new day to all of France. Naive Mary, misunderstands the king's words, thinking that he wants to use the mermaid's power to heal the common people of France, and blindly believes that he plans to release the mermaid back to the sea on the day it completes its mission. Looking at the girl who is full of admiration for him, Louis thinks the time is ripe for recognition. So after calling Mary alone to his study, Louis takes out Mary's mother's relics and recognizes the fact that she is his daughter. Mary is touched but confused. She doesn't understand why Louis suddenly wants to recognize her. Because there are sacrifices you must make. Sacrifice? We need money, child. The young duke. Louis tells Mary that France's treasury is empty and the only way to break the dilemma they face is for her to marry the son of the richest man in France. Mary is thunderstruck by what he says and instantly realizes what her role is, but she is unwilling to become a puppet controlled by the king's power and angrily refuses the king's offer. But when it comes down to it, Mary has no freedom of choice. She is put under Louis's guard and her every move is watched wherever she goes until the union is over. The girl who loses her freedom lies on her bed and can't sleep, she suddenly remembers the mermaid who also has no freedom. Looking at the musketeers guarding the door, Mary is left with only one last way out. By climbing through a window, she successfully avoids surveillance and makes her way to the watery prison where the mermaid is being held, jumping into the water and confiding in it about her ordeal. Suddenly, the mermaid closes its eyes and takes her back to the night it was caught. Mary then realizes that the king and the royal doctor's plan is not as innocent as she thought. Meanwhile, the captain, who senses something is wrong, infiltrates the royal doctor's research lab and discovers their plan to kill mermaids and gain eternal life. To save the mermaids, Mary, father and the captain join forces. The day of the solar eclipse is also the day of Mary's marriage to Michel Lantiac, the son of the richest man in France. In order to relax their vigilance, Mary obediently changes into the wedding dress sent by the king and dresses up as a bride. Under the pretext that the bride needs to confess, father takes Mary out of the cage where she is being watched, and gives her the right to move freely. God has graced you with wings. I only hope you know how to fly. With father's blessing, Mary leaves without looking back. She arrives in the water prison and teams up with the captain to pull the sluice gate that connects her to the outside world, helping the mermaid jump over the fence and into the passageway that allows her to swim to the ocean before she is discovered by the royal doctor. By the time the royal physician finishes preparing the surgical vessels and rushes to the water cell to prepare to dig out the mermaid's heart, they have long since escaped. The king, who gets the news, immediately chases them all the way to the seaside cliffs with his musketeers, and no matter what, he has to fulfill his wish for eternal life. Mary threatens Louis by jumping off a cliff, asking him to promise that he is not going to harm the mermaid's life. While they are at a standstill, a solar eclipse occurs and the light is eaten away little by little. Meanwhile, the mermaid is already following the passage into the sea. Seeing that the moment of immortality is passing little by little, Louis finally makes a decision, and he orders the musketeers to aim at the mermaid and shoot it when the sun is completely covered by the moon. In the face of an obsessed man, Mary issues a final warning. After she jumps off the cliff, he, as a father, has two choices kill the mermaid and gain eternal life, or spare the mermaid so that it can save her and her life. After saying this, she stops looking at Louis's reaction and takes a violent leap, plunging off a high cliff into the sea. Under the tremendous impact, Mary quickly loses consciousness and her life hangs in the balance. This scene shatters Louis's last line of defense, and his desire for affection and guilt for his daughter overcomes his desire for immortality, and he finally orders the musketeers to stop their shooting plan, choosing to let the mermaids heal his only daughter, Mary Joseph. You've always been a great king. Now you've become a great man. Letting go of his obsession, the king regains his faith in God and becomes one of the most important monarchs in France, which under his leadership becomes one of the most powerful kings in Europe. The story ends with Mary and her mermaid friends, living a happy and carefree life in the underwater world. Legend has it that in the waters of Ireland there is a group of magical seals that sheds their seal skin and turns into a human woman who lives on land and brings good luck to fishermen with their songs. Despite seeming impossible, a fisherman named Syracuse actually has an encounter with the mythical creature. On an ordinary afternoon, Syracuse continues his fishing operations. With the sound of the netting machine friction, a woman's body is slowly lifted. Scared Syracuse rushed to call the emergency number, but he does not have time to explain the problem. The woman in the net suddenly moved, seems to have the first signs of awakening. After resuscitation, the woman finally comes to her senses and surveys her surroundings warily, and even though she's already gasping for breath and pain, she asks the man for his identity. Learning that he's just a nice fisherman, her nerves relax a little and she asks Syracuse to take her somewhere warmer to rewarm. Inside the warm cap, Undine curls up into a tiny ball with her arms around her shoulders, finally finding a little security, but fisherman Syracuse's attempt to make a phone call sets off her alarms again. No! I don't! I don't want to see anyone! Her bad shape causes Syracuse to ignore her pleas, 
and he insists on picking up the phone. Watching the man's movements, Andine rushes out of the hatch in horror and runs towards the water, preferring to die rather than see any stranger other than him. At the woman's pleading gaze, Syracuse gives in and takes her to his mother's seaside house, thoughtfully draping her in blankets, hands her sandwiches that he doesn't have time to eat, and settles Andine into a comfortable position before he leaves the cabin, Levy is her alone. The stillness of the house and the gentle ocean breeze soothe Andine's nerves, and she finally dares to step out of her house to wash her clothes by the creek not far away. Following the melodious song, Syracuse finds her and shares his trip. The man's gentle voice instantly draws Andine closer to him, following him to the small dock where Syracuse's boat is moored, ready to join him on a fishing trip. But in the local tradition, a woman following a fishing boat is bad luck for the boat's owner, and Syracuse appears to be in a difficult position, but after seeing Andine's loss, he relents and lets her on board. As expected, bad luck always follows. Syracuse pulls several fish cages in a row, all of which are empty, not a single fish. Watching the man's busy but unproductive behavior, Undine suddenly climbs to a high place, closes her eyes and softly sings. Her voice mixes with the sound of the waves and the wind, so ethereal and penetrating. Undine uses the water as a medium to call in the sea's little elves, and soon fills up the Syracuse's fish cage. Oh my god, what is usual so? Syracuse is amazed by the large lobster lying in the cage and tugs on the rope to continue his work. Undine glances at the man and stops singing, and not surprisingly, Syracuse's new cage is empty, and after a few repetitions of this, he finally determines that the problem lies in the fact that Undine's singing brings him good luck. The two of them walk side by side on their way home, and it's clear that they've grown closer, but Undine declines the offer to go to the market together, still resistant to meeting strangers, and the only thing that reassures her is Syracuse and the house that he's lent him for a temporary stay. As time goes by, the seaside house gives Undine a feel like home, and she becomes more comfortable moving around the place, jumps into the cove every morning like a mermaid, enjoys the crispness of the water through her skin, and then lounges lazily on her raft, like a seal, to soak up the sun. That day while she's swimming in the water, a little girl suddenly runs up to her, claims to be Syracuse's daughter and wants to be friends with Undine. Annie is a kidney failure patient, who needs to go to the hospital every day for dialysis. That day Syracuse went to the hospital too late, and forgot to bring Annie's favorite storybook. During the long waiting time, he had to make up his own experience into a story to tell his daughter to listen to. Can I see the woman? Hear them singing out in Seal Rock. Annie listened to her teacher tell the story of Seal Woman, who is said to come from the sea, take off her seal skin and live on land, and will not go back until the sea calls her. In order to confirm what she thought, Annie went to the library, and borrowed a lot of seal books to check at home. And the more information she reads, the more certain she is that her guess is right. So she tracked her father all the way and found the place where the woman in the story landed. After her father leaves, she controls the wheelchair and appears in front of Undine. Undine is amazed at the little girl, listening to her questions popping out one by one, and kind of freezes, kind of not understanding why she's saying what she's saying. Her reaction falls into Annie's eyes as a sign of weakness, and gets even more excited to give her opinion. During her narration, Undine learns for the first time the story of the seal woman, who, by hiding her sealskin, can live on land and then live happily ever after with the landsmen she meets. Annie's determination to be happy infects Undine and the two soon become good friends and agree to swim together. The girl who hasn't a good health since she was a child doesn't actually know how to swim. Undine gently supports her body and tirelessly teaches the girl swimming skills. Suddenly, she seems to have stepped on something and hurriedly sends Annie to the raft. Then taking a deep breath, she buries her whole body in the seawater and dives to the bottom to retrieve a mysterious package entangled in water plants and hard to see placing it on the raft and rummaging through it excitedly for a few moments. Annie knows that Undine has retrieved her seal skin and may be leaving soon, but she doesn't want to lose this friend, so she proposes to bury the seal skin so they can stay friends. Perhaps out of the desire for a happy life, Undine really finds a clearing, dugs a big hole with Annie, buries the parcel, and reminds Annie that this is a little secret between the two of them, and must not be told. After dealing with this tricky item, Undine's whole being is much more relaxed and offers to help Syracuse share some things when she goes out on the water with him. While she is learning to drive, the fisheries board suddenly appear at the fishing boat annex with a speedboat, and Undine is so startled that she hides under the window and doesn't dare to move a muscle. But with Syracuse's calming presence, she regains her composure and begins again to softly chant music that the men don't understand. Once again, a miracle comes to the tiny fishing boat. Syracuse looks at the salmon in the fishing net and cries out that it is impossible. The only way to catch salmon is with a gill net. How could a trawl be possible? Is the story of the selkie true? Undine leans against the driver's door and smiles faintly. A picture of wonder, as if everything is in her Syracuse of control. But she soon stops laughing, 
The fisheries society men have noticed something unusual on the ship and have to board and inspect it, yanking up the gill netting that is placed inside the cabin. The woman hiding underneath makes them freeze, but they soon stabilize themselves again and continue with the next process, finding no problems and walking away in a huff. Since she has already been discovered by strangers, Andine has no need to continue to hide. She is so engrossed in her own sorrow that she doesn't even realize that she has passed by a man on another boat, and it is this negligence that brings the Syracuse family into great trouble. The first person to suffer an accident is Annie. In the crowded rowing competition site, the little girl's electric wheelchair suddenly out of control, carrying her straight into the sea. Fortunately, Andine's quick reaction, in time to enter the sea to save her. But after being immersed in the water for so long, Annie is still freezing and shivering. When Syracuse sends her daughter home, she is inevitably ridiculed by her ex-wife. Looking at the man who is so angry that his hands are shaking, but he does not dare to say anything. Undine finally understands the reason why Syracuse mocks himself as a circus clown when they first met, and also knows about his past because of alcoholism, losing the custody of his daughter, even though he has been sober for years, but he still can't change the townspeople's opinion of him. And in these days together, Undine has long fallen in love with this kind and gentle man. She comes close to Syracuse, with the actual action to suit the heart of the thousand holes. With Andine's words, Syracuse begins to believe that the legend can be true, and his life, like a puddle of stagnant water, is rekindled by her addition to it. But Syracuse doesn't know the other side of the story, that every seal girl has a husband who, when he appears, takes his wife. That night, Andine is awakened by the roar of a car, and through a gap in the curtains, she sees the devil approaching a little closer, and before he arrives, she hides in a plant shed a short distance away, keeping an eye on the man's movements. With a wave of his hand, a cruise ship comes into Andine's view, and she knows that the devil's helpers are coming, and she has to be more discreet. She is huddled in a hole in the bridge, afraid to make any noise, and it isn't until Syracuse finds her that Andine says her first words. He's coming, which means Andine has to leave, and even though it's hard to leave, she has no choice. But even more chilling to Andine is Syracuse. Annie has been in a serious car accident and is rushed to the emergency room to be revived. Syracuse's ex-wife puts all the blame on Andine, believing that it was her arrival that brought them bad luck, and orders Syracuse to send her away or he will never see his daughter again. In front of the mysterious luck and disaster, Syracuse is really afraid. He is afraid of losing, more afraid of his daughter again accident. After more than two years, he once again will be drunk, through the wine, personally cut off the illusory, beautiful love, back to poverty, loneliness. Looking at the back of the man desperate to go away, Andine's heart broke, she stubbornly sat on the boulder, waiting until dark, have not been able to wait back to the man, and finally desperate to jump into the sea, like a real seal, disappeared at the end of the sea water. The man who has lost his love does not fare well either, and once again returns to his disheveled state, as if nothing can lift his interest. Suddenly, he hears a familiar song, and runs out of the living room to see that it is a song played by the Icelandic national treasure band Sigaros, and not the unique music of the Selkie which means that Andine is not the legendary Selkie, but just an ordinary person, and that the claim of bringing bad luck has become nonsense. After figuring out the crux of the matter, Syracuse rushes back to the island where Andine is dumped to retrieve his injured lover. However, his lover has long disappeared, leaving only a coat lying on the shore. Syracuse is anxious, looking around for Andine's whereabouts, and finally finds the dying woman under an abandoned fishing boat on the other side of the sea. Change yours. Syracuse answers her question with a hug. Because of love, because of the realization that she is just an ordinary person, also need his love and care. The shock of this answer to Andine is nothing less than a volcanic eruption, an earthquake of magnitude 8, and the woman who is wrapped up in intense love finally lets down all of her defenses and reveals the truth that has been hidden from her. Andine is not the mythical seal woman who brings luck, but a bad woman who is forced by her gangster husband to transport and sell drugs in another country. Along with the memories, the dusty truth slowly unravels, and all the unpleasantness and betrayal seem to dissipate with the narration, and the two of them return home hand in hand. Suddenly, they are aware of the presence of a strange man in the house. Andine's demonic husband has brought helpers to find over. This trip is to force her to hand over the original batch of goods, seeing that Syracuse is no match for them. Andine is so desperate that she can only take them to the place where she dug the hole in the first place, digs three feet into the ground but never sees the shadow of the backpack. It turns out that Annie is worried that Andine will leave and hides the sealskin in advance. Finally, with Andine's assurance that she would not leave, Annie finally confesses the hiding place of the backpack. Under her guidance, the devils manage to locate the goods, and while probing out to retrieve the package, they are kicked into the sea by Andine, and the man who can't swim is quickly defeated and is eventually taken away by the police. 
because of his lack of Irish citizenship, Undine is about to be deported to his home country. In order to leave behind the love of his life, Syracuse listens to the priest's advice and decides to get a license to marry her. And a wedding ceremony is held, and the three finally live the eternal bliss of the mythological story. Fairy tales and reality are like parallel lines that never intersect, but love builds a bridge with its sincerity, making the lines that never intersect meet and making all the impossible possible. In ancient times, mermaids and humans have the same ancestor, apes, but with the change of geography, some apes are forced to go into the sea to live and evolve into mermaids. The other part evolves into humans. Mermaids and humans are supposed to work together to maintain the peace and beauty of the earth. However, with the development of economy and technology, human beings changed. They begin to destroy the natural environment and kill other animals for money without any bottom line. The mermaids do not escape the tragic fate of being hurt by human beings. Don, a real estate businessman, wants to make more money, so he commissions a Japanese scientific research company to develop a super powerful sonar technology for repelling and strangling marine creatures in order to obtain government approval for reclaiming land from the sea. Shortly afterward, the extremely lethal sonar is put into the sea by the staff. Upon it reaching the designated location, the researchers press the last activation button, and the sonar begins to work. It immediately launches an acoustic attack, and all the sea creatures within 50 miles of its center are affected. Some are instantly killed and dissipated. Some scurry away from its attack range. The worst of them are the mermaids who are left with only the last piece of habitat. They have nowhere to go but to endure these inhuman tortures. As their companions disappeared and died, they have to hide inside a nearby abandoned ship to heal and revitalize. But this is by no means a permanent solution. In order to return to the ocean and reclaim the home they depend on, the mermaids hold a family meeting, and even the mermaid elders, who have been dormant for hundreds of years, appear. After discussion, they decide to send Sasha, the prettiest mermaid, to take the initiative to approach Dunn, a real estate developer, to carry out a seduction and assassination plan on him. The simple mermaids believe that if they kill him, the sonar, which is a constant threat to their lives, is going to stop working and they can return to living in the ocean. They take out a large pair of incredibly sharp scissors and cut Sasha's tail open. Then she puts on socks and shoes, and disguises it as human feet. Then, on a skateboard, she enters human society as a human being and tries to deal with the vendors. Sasha's disguise is so successful that not only is she not identified, but she also buys her favorite roast chicken. Sasha runs home happily and reports the good news to everyone. This means that their plan moves to the next stage, and the celebration banquet that Dunn organizes is the perfect time to do so. At this extravagant party, fun and indulgence permeate every corner, and Dunn, the absolute star of the night, is in the arms of several beauties, enjoying their flirtatious tenderness. A flashy red sports car arrives at the door, but it's not Sasha, the mermaid we've all been waiting for. It's Raylan, the bossy lady boss. She makes her way through the crowd to Dunn with great aplomb, removes an $8 million watch and throws it into the pool before loudly announcing that it is to be given to whoever fishes it out first. At her call, the women surrounding Dunn pounce into the water like mad, and Raylan is thus given the chance to be alone with the men. Using her beauty as bait, she tries to lure Dunn into agreeing to work together on the project in the bay, and is about to succeed when a delicate female voice comes from behind her. They follow the voice and impatiently look back, only to be stunned by the scene before them. They only see a girl whose makeup is smudged by water and whose face resembles a color palette grinning her red lips and giggling happily at them. Although the bodyguards react quickly and subdue Sasha, a mermaid disguised as a human, Raylan is still furious and yells at them in front of Dunn, then leaves the party in a huff despite his retention. At this time, Dunn also learns from the butler that the girl is not on their invitation list, so he has to participate in the interrogation work himself. Unexpectedly, just as he approaches her, the girl takes the initiative to admit the fact of sneaking into the party, and then expresses her love to him madly, and then shoves him a note with her phone number on it, strongly requesting Dunn to call and ask her out when he is free. Dunn is speechless and signals the bouncer to kick this crazy girl out of the party. Sasha, however, is happy that not only does she meet her target, Dunn, today, but she also impresses him so much that she's sure she'll get a call from him soon. Back home, Sasha plops down on the deck of the ship and stares intently at her only cell phone with the rest of the mermaid clan, expecting the phone to ring and receive an inviting call from Dunn. However, they are destined to be disappointed. Dunn is too busy flirting with his partner Raylan at the moment to think about the strange girl who has shocked him with her strange behavior. But Raylan's condescension gives Sasha a new opportunity. Raylan, a rich lady, actually despises Dunn, who has developed from the lowest level of society, believing that the lowly genes he carries are somewhat unworthy of her nobility. She is only motivated by profit when she gets involved with him. Her comments infuriate Dunn, and as a retort to her, he dials Sasha's number in front of Raylan and asks her to have dinner with him. Then Dunn pretends to be very handsome as he dumps his clothes and leaves in style, leaving Raylan behind. Meanwhile, the mermaids are in a huge orgy. They use the catapult power of the giant slingshot to fly out of the bottom of the pod, and then with all sorts of weapons, they aggressively climb ashore and hide in the doorway waiting for a chance to make their move, ready to kill Dunn at the first opportunity. 
to bad. It's not Dun who comes to pick up Sasha for a date, but his bodyguards. The mermaid's first assassination fails, and they can only watch them leave. Sasha, the only one who can get close to Dunn, becomes the last hope to assassinate him. Brother Octopus immediately opens the door and chases after them, delivering the bag containing all kinds of assassination hidden weapons to Sasha. However, it is not easy for Sasha to see Dunn, and assassination is even more difficult. After Sasha arrives at Dunn's company, taking advantage of the gap between the bodyguard going to invite Dunn, Sasha puts a few drops of the mermaid-specific poison in a glass of water and carefully switches the direction of the glass in preparation for Dunn's arrival to drink it. What she doesn't expect is that the person who comes first is Dunn's secretary, who needs to conduct a security check on her as a way to safeguard his boss's life. Sasha's plan to poison Dunn goes bust. Immediately after, the secretary searches Sasha's bag and finds all sorts of strange seafood, including sea urchins that stick in his hands and a fishbone knife that is supposedly used to open sea urchins. Just like that, under Sasha's sincere gaze, the secretary believes her story and prepares to drink the water and take her to see Dunn. Sasha is so nervous which watches him drink the water and gets that her heart jumps out of her chest, not knowing what to do, until she sees Dunn walking towards her. So she quietly follows the secretary when she's not looking and manages to sneak into Dunn's office. Dunn, who is busy lecturing his staff, doesn't notice Sasha's presence, which gives her a great opportunity to commit the crime. Sasha immediately fumbles for a sea urchin coated with toxin and raises it high in the air ready to stab Dunn, only to be hit in the head by a flying ashtray and nearly discovered, so she hastily flies to a corner to hide. The tenacious Sasha doesn't give up and continues her stabbing of Dunn, soon finding a new opportunity to throw her concealed weapon again, only to have it bounce off the clear glass and lodge itself in Sasha's forehead instead. Sasha, bruised and battered, still doesn't give up, and squirming strongly, she grabs her last weapon, a fishbone knife, and crawls behind Dunn, attempting to stab him in the calf before using the toxin on the top of the knife to kill Dunn. Dunn suddenly starts dancing, dodging Sasha's knives with precision at every turn. Not only that, but she is hit by Dunn's golf club and screams out in pain. Dunn is startled to hear the cry and finds Sasha's presence. He then remembers his bet with Raylan, but the secretary doesn't comprehend his true intentions and actually takes the girl to the office. Dunn has no choice but to take time to deal with Sasha and tries to send her away by offering her money. But to his surprise, Sasha, unlike other women, is not interested in money at all, and no matter how much money he gives her, Sasha doesn't change her mind about going out with him. That's when Raylan arrives, ready to settle the score with Dunn, only to be irritated even more by the images before her. Dunn is equally impatient with Raylan's interference, so he changes his mind and takes Sasha out on a date. They go to Sasha's favorite roadside stand and eat grilled chicken together. The familiar smell brings back Dunn's childhood memories of his father. He remembers that when he was a child, his family was so poor that he could only eat meat once in a long time. And one of the things that makes the deepest impression on him is the half-roasted chicken leg that his father picked up from the street. The flavor is exactly the same as the roasted chicken he eats today. Then, Dunn can't contain his tears. Sasha is touched by his genuine feelings and gradually changes her opinion of him and begins to soften and sympathize with him. Sasha cries with Dunn, laughs with him, goes to the amusement park together to play the favorite games of children, and takes him to make up for the missing regrets of his childhood. It's the first time Dunn has laughed so much since he grew up, and it's almost as if he's happier than when he won the $30 billion project. He realizes that his happiness is brought to him by the girl beside him with a silly smile. He thinks to himself that he has his heart set on her, even if she is not the prettiest looking, sweetest talking woman he has ever been around. So on the way to take Sasha home, Dunn cannot help but hold her hand. The ambiguous atmosphere climbs with the temperature that is exchanged between the palms. At the same time, not far away from the house, the mermaid have long been ready, as long as Dunn steps into the door of his house, waiting for him only death. Sasha is torn. She doesn't want Dunn to die, but she doesn't want to betray her family until she reaches the doorstep of her home and finally makes a choice. She stops Dunn from trying to enter her home. Her choice outrages her family, and when confronted, Sasha is at a loss for words and finally comes up with a lame excuse to shrug off the blame. She says she's been out of the water too long and can't hold on. Unexpectedly, the next night, Dunn shows up at her door and discovers Sasha's identity as a mermaid. When the mermaids see him, they simply put on a sack and tie Dunn to the bottom of the pod. Dunn wakes up with a splash of water and stares in horror. He can't believe what he's seeing. Octopus, angrily accuses him of the harm he has brought to the mermaids, and points out that he must go to hell today to atone for his sins. The other mermaids then go along with Brother Octopus' orders and prepare to kill Dunn. Dunn must find a way to save himself in the face of the death threat. He yells out to stop the mermaids and points out that killing him can't solve anything, and that only by letting him go back can he turn off the sonar and return them to a safe and worry-free ocean home. Dunn's words cause the mermaids to think, and they think he has a point and are ready to let him back in. But Octopus, who has seen how shameless humans can be and knows that many are missing credit, insists on killing Dunn to avenge his dead companions. In the nick of time, Sasha appears and lets Dunn go. She trusts Dunn to turn off the sonar and not lie to her. Dunn really does not betray Sasha's trust in him. 
he escapes back to the company. The first time he googles the news about destroying the marine environment, all kinds of bloody cases are shocking, and he believes the mermaid's accusations a little bit. Immediately afterward, he goes to the sonar control room and offers to feel the power of the sonar. With the activation of the sonar, Dunn really experiences the pain suffered by the mermaids, and he realizes how cruel and absurd his previous decision was. Dunn then orders the sonar to be turned off. His strange behavior arouses the suspicion of his partner Raylan. She quickly associates it with the sound not belonging to dolphins that the staff recorded on the bottom of the sea not long ago, and combines it with Dunn's whereabouts and erratic behavior. She quickly guesses Sasha's identity as a mermaid. It turns out that she has long been aware of the existence of mermaids and has already begun to investigate and experiment with their efficacy. In order to realize the goal of making a lot of money, Raylan personally leads people to the secret base of the mermaid race and launches an extermination operation against the mermaids. Countless mermaids hiding in the bottom of the ship to heal their wounds are forced out of the water by the humans' hot weapons. They are brutally slaughtered, and the oozing blood stains the water. Sasha doesn't escape being hunted down either, but she always believes that Dunn won't lie to her. In desperation, the mermaids find that the sonar has stopped, and they jump into the sea, fleeing to the depths of the ocean. A badly injured Sasha is a step too slow and is caught by Raylan. Raylan smiles triumphantly at her sorry state and orders Sasha to be killed. At the moment of crisis, Dunn descends by Sasha's side like a god in the sky, ignoring Raylan's threats and the arrows sticking in his body, and carries Sasha in his arms, walking towards the shore with firm but difficult steps to help Sasha return to the ocean. At the same time, the SWAT team also rush to the scene, and arrest Raylan and others who are lawless and brutal killings, to receive the trial from the law. Since then, Dunn stops his reclamation program and donates all his money to environmental organizations for the protection of the marine environment. Afterwards, Dunn announces his retirement from the public, and with his lover Sasha, lives a life of seclusion, traveling the ocean world. This is a story of love and reflection. It lets us know that only when human beings live in harmony with nature can we have true happiness. If you like my channel or enjoy watching me dance, please leave a comment in the comment section saying dance. Adam.